first I would like to thank the organizers. They're doing a really great job. Um, thank you for inviting them for me. Uh, actually, I will try to show how we got into the space. Uh, we are very well aware that um, no organic form can go to space by itself. So there's no flower, no animal, no, no individual <coughs> that can, let's say, decide and say, now I will go to space. Uh, I mean, you can go mentally, <laughs> but actually your body will stay here. <laughs> and uh, what we question in our center is what has to be done that we reach the space. 150 years ago, and ideas of how to live in space were really in the fantasy worlds. So they were thinking of brick moons, they were thinking of uh, sorry, of using cannons to, to shoot ourselves <coughs> into deep space. Uh, the major problem I have <coughs> was but at that time, it was really impossible to go to space. And, uh, I mean, it was impossible to go, it was impossible to think, everything was in the fiction, everything was just imaginable. There was no, no hard facts, no hard ideas, no hard knowledge that you can uh, stick to it and go with it into space. And <laughs> What had to happen was to start using different kind of uh, use of knowledge. We know that constructivistic way of thinking is not thinking with what we know, but what we can know. These are the products of our mind, not, not the products that we found in our surroundings. So it's not about cutting the trees and building the ladder to the, to the space, or, or let's say teaching a, a goose to fly us to the moon or, or building a bigger cannon. So it's not about <laughs> this empirical knowledge that we have and expand, but it's about different kind of thinking. And it happened with, in Russia with Kuzmist philosophers and artists, and they were questioning themselves what are the biggest, what's the, the singular biggest problem in this world? And at that time, it still is the question whether the God exists or not exist. People are actually killing each other because of this question. And they simply said, look, why don't we check if God exists or not exists? Why don't we go up there and, and check if there's a God? <coughs> and and uh, what they did, they said, OK, let's go there. And how? Let's build the rockets. And this is how Konstantin uh, Tsiolkovsky started to construct the first, I mean, to draw the first drawings of the first rockets, to deal with the propulsion, to deal with, uh, with aerodynamics. So <laughs> this, this turning point of search for the god <laughs> uh, leads us to, to the first rocket. What you see here is not an abstract painting. This is actually a very early sketch of the 20th century. Painter Malevich was, is generally known as abstract painter, but this is suprematistic painting. And this is not colors, and forms, and compositions. This is usually an Earth, a Moon, and a planet, planet satellite. So his uh, idea was that everything technological should go and is naturally to go to space and live in space by itself. <coughs> so they had these early ideas that technology is the only mean with which we can go to space. There's no organic form, no individual form, <coughs> like goose, like cannon, let's say, that we can go to space. We need sophisticated technology that we still don't know. And this was the first step that we don't know what to, to, to use. <coughs> in the next, um, decade, 
So from the beginning of 20th century, for 20 years, let's say not more than 50 or 100 people was working on the first rockets, on the first propulsion systems, first liquid motors, uh, and up to, let's say, the end of 20s, we didn't get the successful rocket launch. But 30 years, we got, we got the, first, the first rocket. But how we got to this first working, uh, working uh, systems? <coughs> the composite projection is methodology of using abstraction of art and science putting it like a projection into the cultural field, like a cultural application, into the cognitive systems to, to ourselves. I have very good examples. <coughs> the first one is the story of the first liquid-fueled rocket. It's not a work of a scientist. It's a work, it's more complex not even even project, but complex situation. <laughs> On one side we have, you might know him, it's Fritz Lang. He has two famous mm, films. One is uh, Metropolis, very well known, but not so successful. Another one was Frau im Mond, The Woman on the Moon. This is the shot from this <laughs> film. And the other guy is Hermann Obert. He's the constructor of the first rocket. And he was a technical advisor for the film, how technology should look like so that it's mostly realistic. So all the technology used in the film is scientifically proven as possible. And at the end, when they shot the movie and prepared for the premiere, he got the money for the first rocket from film production. So not from the state, not from the army, not from the some institutes or universities, but he got it from the that time German Hollywood. And <laughs> the history of rocketry begins in art, in culture, not in let's say in technical laboratory. I mean, of course, the first experiment, but the first money for the first rocket came from the from the <laughs> from the culture. <laughs> Another little bit more sad story, the story about Disney and uh, Peter von Braun. Peter von Braun, <laughs> he's the guy, he, he was actually a, uh, a student of Obert, and his sad story is that he destroyed London during the Second World War. He, he built the first working rockets for destruction. I think he built thousands of them. On the other side, we have Disney. American government captured von Braun after Second World War, brought him to the States, and kept him <laughs> because he was the only person at that time, with the only team at that time, that was capable of building the rockets of destruction. But since no one else in the States was capable of designing the functional systems, <laughs> they invited from Brown <laughs> to build first Saturn rockets to prepare, I mean, most of these inter intercontinental ballistic rockets were made by him at the early stage. But uh, since the government wanted to make this program popular, not just destructive, but popular, uh, <laughs> they started with the story of going into the space, so that men should go into space. This was the competition at that time. And to build up this story, it's not, there's no scientist that can do this job with the best rockets. We needed the most genius guy at that time, it was Disney, who knew how to build up the story, who knew what, it, how, what is this our cognitive system, what we perceive and how we deal with this. So that something, I mean, look, 100 years ago, saying we should go to space, we will be in space. It was like, you're joking. Even 50 years ago, it was like, okay, we sent first person up there, but 
Why sending more? And both of them build the whole story in the period of five years through the magazines, through the media, through the cartoons for the children, and toys, and everything. And they build up an idea in five years. It's something completely natural to leave this place. And it's like saying today, yes, in five years we will live on Mars. You will smile and say, he's stupid. But they build up this story. And Americans believed, yes, we can live in space. And <laughs> this was the major icon of this idea was the space station uh, in the orbit. So, <laughs> and <laughs> another example, it's a little bit different. It's about the movie, Odyssey 2001 shot by Stanley Kubrick and with technical advisor Fred Ordway. Fred Ordway uh, was one of the founders of, of, of NASA at the time. He's still alive, more than 80s. <laughs> but what's really important that Stanley Kubrick didn't went just and he wanted to make a fantasy science fiction movie about life in space. No, he said to, to Fred, his his advisor and uh, assistant, look, go to scientists and tell me precisely how it's going to be in 2001. Don't come with fantasies and idealizations and stuff like that. Bring me the scientific picture, how precisely it is going to be. So what is possible, not what's impossible. And then they came up with ideas of the rockets, of space station, of pencils, of movements, so all the details they came up with. Of course, also the, this space station. <coughs> this is also one of the icons of the movie. So, <coughs> in 1971, so less than 100 years ago from that brick moon that you saw at the beginning, we got the first functional space station. So it's like saying today, yes, in 100 years we will live on Mars and take it for granted. If you believe or not, but this is, like, this is possible. This is the story of how we got the first space station in the orbit in 100 years. It was artists and scientists working together. It was not just about technical issues, it was also about cultural issues. How to make people <coughs> not believe, but understand. <coughs> to get into the details, to get the picture, to bring the scientific knowledge to the common people, to understand it into details. And then you get, and with the next generation, hundreds, thousands of scientists working on these issues. Sorry. <coughs> one more illustration. <laughs> On one side we have a painting from 1931, on the other side we have a photography from these days. I mean, you can see similarities, but the most important is that in the 30s they saw, I mean, they understood the issues of form in space. It was not about animals flying into space, it was not about some energies going into space. They understood that very basic forms are natural in empty space. <coughs> so this is, as I said before, constructivism. It's about constructivistic forms, very simple, technical, functional systems. This is, this is all you need to live in space. And this is what we have today, International Space Station in front of the sun. So totally the same forms. <coughs> And to understand this, in the center is the composite projection. On one side we have existing knowledge, what we know at this moment, and on the other side we have what's, what we know that is possible. We don't know precisely how, but we know that it's somehow possible. It, it takes time, okay, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, but it is possible. If the Mars is there, we can get there. Not in five years, in ten years, but in fifty, hundred years, we will be there. <coughs> and to understand this <coughs> background of this process, we have to understand the knowledge that we are dealing with. The knowledge, classically, in, in, in classic epistemology, 
this intersection between between the beliefs and the truth. There's no absolute truth and no absolute beliefs. <laughs> but what, what we learn during the history, especially in, um, let's say, 500 years ago, that there's no God that will send us into space. I mean, God went into space, into up there. We can't. <laughs> and we needed some more, let's say, functional tools, approaches, methodologies, how to deal with this knowledge. And that's why on this intersection, people mostly focused on art and science. These were the two most functional uh, pools of knowledge, hum human practices at all, that, that actually uh, had some results and some functional results for the individual, for the society, for anyway. And, but at that time it was still in one person, it was a genius, a master, who was an artist and scientist. But through the centuries, art and science started to separate from each other. So we had only artists and only scientists, and they don't understand each other anymore. They're very smart, both of them, but they don't understand each other. We still do have this intersection of art and science, but I will tell you this is the most dirty place on the earth. And this is the most horrible wars are going on in this field. Because when you are an artist and go into the scientific society, you're there just a guest for a short time, then go away. Because you don't understand the problems. And you're ne never an equal researcher. But when scientists go into the artistic field, it's just an amateur. Because really don't understand art. Art is something completely different from science. And <laughs> Since we are dealing daily with this situation, we actually separated both of them. And said, artists, you go in that corner, you go in that corner. And this intersection, we will call it a composite. The third form, not, nothing to do with art and science anymore, but it has to be relevant in art and science. Because if it's not relevant in art and science, then it can be religion. It can be in the field of beliefs, not the truth and the knowledge. So we still have to be, let's say, we actually call it a diplomatic protocol between art and science. It's, I mean, these are two different continents, two different, uh, two different planets, <coughs> and you need a diplomatic protocol between one and another. And that's why <coughs> we built a cultural space program. All the existing space programs are technical space programs. They know how to send something technical out of the solar system. They know how to send, I mean, to build a space station in the orbit. They know how to send a man to moon. They did send a man to moon. Of course they did. <laughs> and this is technically possible. But how to be a human in space? They don't deal with this issue. And if we want to not to expand, but to understand ourselves on the Earth, we have to understand ourselves in the space. And that's why we need the cultural space program to understand human practices, not technical practices. <laughs> and the existing space programs are dealing with the basic sciences, with uh, natural sciences, applied sciences, with the social sciences. This is the military space program, civil space program and commercial space programs. But what they don't do is art and humanistics. And <coughs> if you want to have a complete approach to space research, a complete um, understanding of what we are on the Earth and in this space, we need to involve art and humanistics into space research and into dealing with space. <coughs> and Hermann Potocznik Norden, Slovene space pioneer, he is a pioneer also in cultural activities, not only in, in uh, technical. I mean, he was involved in the First World War. He experienced all of this dehumanization on the battlefront. And that's why he was the first one 
with the technical means answer the question how to live in space. That's why he's the first architect in space. He literally built the first architecture for the space. Because he wanted to answer the question how to live in space, not just how to reach the space with rockets, with propulsion, aerodynamics, and all these technical issues. So this is why he's so important, not because he's a local hero and he was born here or there, but because he was the first one who used technical knowledge to answer the question how to live in space. And this is why today we are working on doing art in space, sending artists in space. Up to today, in space there was more than 500 people. Only seven of them went into space by their own decision. So they said, okay, I would like to go to space, I will pay and I will go there. But all of the rest went there by selection because they were, because they were capable of going there. And none of them was there, let's say, free to do whatever he or she wanted to do. They were inside of the protocols, they were inside of the process, they were inside of the limitations, <coughs> because they were part of the technical process, not cultural process. And that's why we have to send an artist in space. So to start dealing with the question, how is it to be a human in space? Thank you.